Well, we have a pretty fantastic lineup. Now, following the inspiring words uh, from Bogolo Joy, we can really turn to the question, what will it take? What will it take for the African continent to lead in the climate transition, especially the innovators and the investors that can really, as you said, make the businesses thrive, those that can really provide the solutions to climate vulnerable communities. And as we said, we're really at this crux because we're seeing all the opportunity and at the same time, we also see the barriers. We also see the work that we need to do. And that's why we're all here today to discuss how we will make that uh, change uh, over really the next decade. So I'm gonna first ask um, my great panelists in uh, one minute or less, to introduce yourself uh, and your company, and we're going to start with James. Uh, thanks, Melis, and thanks for putting together this amazing event. It's, uh, it's a real thrill. Is it okay? Okay, great. It's a real privilege to be uh, here with, with uh, this amazing group in this amazing space. Uh, my name is uh, James Irongo Mwangi. I am the, uh, one of the founders and chief executive officer of Africa Climate Ventures. We are a venture builder focused on massively scalable interventions uh, on the continent. And I am also a, a founder of the Climate Action Platform Africa, which is a think tank looking at climate positive growth in Africa. Thank you, Miley's. Hi, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here today. I'm Kate Kello, and I'm the founder and CEO of Amini. We are building an environmental data infrastructure for the continent, and I'll tell you what it means a little bit later. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Anne-Marie Chidzero. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for FSD Africa Investments. I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do, but I just want to share with uh, our keynote speaker how energized I feel to be in this room. I mean, it's amazing. Um, I had the opportunity of being with the big corporates and I, I chose you guys because it's just really exciting and heartwarming to see the energy and, and the opportunity uh, on this continent. And I, the future is yours and we're here to, to make sure that that future is a sustainable one. Thank you. Okay, thanks, I'm the last person. Um, thanks so much. My name is Nilo Hodise. Um, founder of Tola, so we accelerate biosecurity compliance, um, ensuring that small and medium-sized businesses on the continent are compliant in terms of organic, uh, climate sustainability, and a whole umbrella of different types of compliances so that they are climate resilient. Fantastic, thank you all. So let's start by um, actually painting a little bit of the picture. And I think we have uh, probably the best person to do that. So I'll turn to you, James. Uh, you recently left after many years at Dalberg to launch Africa Climate Ventures, and you're also involved in CAPE. So clearly you recognize this massive opportunity. But what, do you, what are the key drivers that you think are enabling the opportunity concretely? Can you describe that for us? Happy to, and with apologies for a large portion of this room who've heard the spiel several times, but I'll, I'll try and do it quickly. Um, I, I think Boholo made a, already began to capture some of what is both our challenge and our opportunity. Let's see what it looks like. Um, and the way I would characterize it is as follows. Historically, Africa, when we talk about climate change, we focus on the reality that Africa did not cause it, is feeling the brunt of it, and ha lacks the resources to, to deal with much of its implications. And that the world should address that, which is absolutely true. And that's a critical debate for us to have. It is a debate that sometimes unintentionally obscures another point. It's not even a debate, it's a fact that obscures another fact, which is if you have the young workforce, if you have the superabundance of renewable energy, if you have the massive array of raw materials, land, and other natural assets that every single African country, to varying degrees in different aspects, is endowed with, then you have three pathways available to meaningfully contribute, so to not just be the victim of climate change, but to play a central role in the world meeting the Paris goals and indeed getting back to a more habitable and balanced climate. The first of those pathways is it is worth a lot 
to the whole world for Africa to embrace green growth. If we go on an emissions intensive pathway for our own development, say the pathway adopted by the most recent countries to really make this jump in a meaningful way, countries like Vietnam, for example, if you model a Vietnam style business as usual transition over the next 30 years into middle, in, middle income status for most of Africa, that adds something like between seven and 10 billion tons of new emissions every year into the atmosphere. There is no climate model that is resilient to that in terms of what we are expecting in order to stay below net zero. So how do we deal with that? We clean up our cooking, we leapfrog to e-mobility, we think about regenerative agriculture, we, think about, we rethink how we construct our homes, and, and, and. Think about every aspect of what a developing and evolving society needs, and we are going to need on the continent innovations that allow us to do those things, improve quality of life without increasing emissions. Huge opportunity worth literally gigatons a year, and the question is how do we pay for it, and there's a number of ways that one, one can think about that. The second opportunity proceeds from the first, because one of the things that drives the first opportunity, the fact that Africa can actually, without much cost, leapfrog to green, is the fact that we have so much untapped renewable energy. And that untapped renewable energy, coupled with our raw materials, coupled with our, la with our labor force, opens up a second opportunity, which is climate competitiveness. I spent years trying to figure out how would Africa increase its share of global industrial activity from the three to four percent that we have now to something close to our share of global population. Even 15 percent would be transformative for this continent and still be less than Africa's fair share. Now, in the old days, we used to look at it as, can our labor be cheap enough? Can our infrastructure be good enough? And the thing is, each of those things is kind of a circular problem. There's a limited amount of skilled labor, so it's initially expensive until someone comes over. But once you factor in carbon, Africa is the greenest place to do much of the world's primary processing, a lot of the world's data processing, and with its labor force, a lot of the world's labor-intensive manufacturing once you begin to develop and invest in our green energy resources. But it's true across the board. When you think about agriculture, any space where you see Africa exporting stuff that hasn't had its full amount of value added to it in order for someone else to use energy to add value, that is a missed climate opportunity. There's carbon there. And as the world begins to care more about that, there are businesses to be built that are saying, we are offering greener minerals, we are offering greener agricultural produce, just by virtue of the fact that we are processing it with renewables, using organic and climate smart processes on the continent. So that's the second thing. We're reducing the world's emissions by doing more in Africa. And the third pathway is recognizing we're going to overshoot. There's no doubt about that. We are going to emit more than our carbon budget before 2050. And science is very clear. We're going to need a massive industry of carbon removal around the world. Some of that is going to be about preserving and expanding Africa's forests and natural resources. Our mangroves, our grasslands, our peatlands, all of the stuff we need to do to develop an economic model for preserving, conserving, and expanding those. We also need our farmers thinking of, of their primary products, not just as the food and other products that they sell into the market, but as increasing the amount of carbon they're drawing down into the biosphere and putting into the, the, the lithosphere, into our soils, right? And, and for that, you need labor. It's a lot of work. But the bad news is, I was just reading an article today, the world's forests this year emitted more carbon than they absorbed. Simply because we have hit a tipping point where climate change itself is feeding on itself, right? You're seeing forest fires everywhere, right? You're seeing die-offs of, 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 of natural sinks. And that means we are going to have to give nature a hand because we've already pushed nature over a tipping point. And that means a lot of innovation in how else do we remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Some of the promising early spaces, the things that are already, there's no reason why we should not be massively scaling the application of biochar to African land. We have the labor, we have the biomass. It's a technology that's 5,000 years old. The question is who will figure out how to scale it and roll it out. There's also enhanced rock weathering, literally taking uh, carbon-loving basalts, crushing them and spreading them on our soils. Both of these things, oddly enough, are fertilizer. They lower soil pH, which is one of the biggest problems Africa's farmers have, and they increase moisture retention, and they allow us to farm more. 
And then, so those kinds of things are available to us. The question is who will come up with the scalable business models for doing that across the continent at gigaton scale? Billions of tons of material needs to be spread on Africa's land. We have plenty of land, we've got plenty of labor, someone needs to build those businesses. And then on the far end, there's going to be a residual that we will only get to with highly engineered technologies. This is using scientific processes that are well understood and figuring out energy efficient ways to draw that 0.6% of carbon in the atmosphere and capture it and, and get rid of it. And we are well positioned. I'm not going to repeat that aspect. Many of you will have heard it. But the work that folks like Octavia and others are doing is exactly that. How do we start to build an industry that in the beginning will be very expensive and energy intensive but, remember, but you know what? In, in the 1970s, Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the roof of the White House and he was told this is wasteful because they cost $70,000 a panel, right? But you had to start there in order to ride the cost curves. Imagine that. You have to start somewhere, indeed. So green growth, climate competitiveness, and carbon removal as a massive opportunities. And as you said, like we need to find the businesses that can actually scale and reach big, big scale, and that needs financing. So I do want to turn to Anne-Marie. At FSE Africa, they've really positioned themselves and done an amazing job over the past few years in greening finance and financing green. So Anne-Marie, what does that mean to you, and how is FSE Africa and FSE Africa Investment in particular aiming to finance the innovation that we need to reach the goals that James talked about? Okay, thank you very much, Miley. So just um, a, a little bit of an explanation of who we are. So FSD stands for Financial Sector Deepening. Um, so we're FSD Africa, and what we do is we try to um, make the investments, uh, but also support the policy and the ecosystem that will make finance work for Africa's sustainable future. Um, and what I do is I um, make the investments um, in the frontier, forward-looking, innovative financing solutions to achieve that. So let me unpack that a little bit. Um, so, so there are clearly failures in our financial sector. Um, capital is just not going to where it needs to go. Um, there's also a great opportunity for the African financial sector to leapfrog the way other financial systems have developed in, in other countries. Um, you take, you know, 20 years ago, the well, 15 years ago, in Pesa, how that leapfrog, you know, the the uh, communication. Um, a sector um, and so there's great opportunity to do that so what we are doing now is again being at the frontier of finance really trying to drive finance to to ensure that capital goes to where it's needed is to back the early stage innovative solutions that can do that and our portfolio which currently sits at about 92 million pounds has a diverse group of um, intermediaries that we've backed um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those that are pertinent to this uh, this community. Um, so we are a backer of Catalyst. Um, and the reason why we decided to back them is because they're working, they're, they're, they're um, providing innovative solutions to finance early stage companies in the climate space. So in order to tap into the opportunities that James talked about, we need you guys to actually come up with the ideas and you need the funding, we get that. And so we back Mylis because she's got and her team, um, Karen and Maxime and others, um, because they have a very innovative way of doing this. Um, so we back them um, with this early stage funding in order for them to, to anchor and, and, and raise, a, a raise a fund. We've also backed Persistent, I don't know if Persistent is here, um, similar um, approach uh, again in climate adaptation. Um, and we've actually anchored James and his, um, his, his, uh, his GP. So again, conversations that we had, we're trying, to, we're trying to find those innovators and then work with them, provide them with the investment capital. We want to return on our investment. And we know we'll get a return on, on our investment because we're backing brilliant ideas, brilliant people at the cutting edge of change on the continent. Um, we've also backed another facility that's really trying to test innovative funding structures um, that are particularly designed to supporting small and growing businesses. Um, so it's really testing out what we are all used to in the more formal world of private equity and private debt is those structures are structures that 
have actually originated from the from the northern hemisphere. We need to find structures that are more appropriate to our to our needs, our societies, our communities. Um, so so that's what we do. We're a catalytic investor. We take on a lot of risk. Um, but we are taking that risk because we believe in the opportunity, we believe in the founders that we're backing, um, and, and we really actually want to test how these structures can, can grow. We're not only working um, in the venture space, we're also looking at capital, capital market structures, we're really trying to deepen capital markets. And, and it's important to make that link because one day many of you will want to IPO. And if we don't have deep capital markets to do that, that's going to be a challenge. And so we are, we are working across the spectrum of financial sector um, in order to, to really scale, and mobilize capital, um, smooth out the way it moves um, to meet Africa's climate agenda. Thanks, Maïs. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And, and uh, frankly, for everyone in this room, I have to say we couldn't have asked for a better anchor partner because FSD Africa is unique in the creative creativity they have in thinking about the solutions for every single fund and then also at the bigger scale like a bonds right for the African continent and that's a really really unique player in the ecosystem hopefully catalyzing a lot more of the capital sitting in this room today so let's move to um, to uh, Kate first um, and then uh, to you Nele on the entrepreneur side, you heard, okay, we have to take the solutions to massive scale. We've heard about the opportunity. So for the two of you, what was, in your view, the opportunity you saw and the reason why you decided to launch your venture? And what do you see as that path? What? Yes. What do you see as that path to scale in both your, your cases? Starting with you, Kate. Thanks, Miles. So when we found it, Hello, now it's working. Um, so we actually, Amini was actually born out of COP last year. Um, and we saw two opportunities on, on the continent. On one side, supporting businesses, global businesses with supply chain onto the continent um, to report to regulators because the regulations are coming for them from the SEC, from Europe, but they had no visibility on what was happening at the last mile. And the second opportunity was supporting regenerative, the transition to regenerative agriculture at scale. Um, but when we started building, we realized that there was a deep issue, which was the data scarcity on the continent. It was really, really difficult to access high quality data so that we could build the machine learning models and all the solutions, the platforms to solve those two purposes. So we talked we talk to ourselves and we were like, okay, so if we continue that path and we continue building the solution, we're gonna run into that data issues again, again, and again. So why don't we pivot towards building that data infrastructure? And then in turn, providing this data to others to build on top of. So that's how we pivoted towards the data infrastructure play. And originally we built a data aggregation platform. So we used geospatial data, we calibrated against ground truths, we scrapped for any ounces of data we could find, soil studies and so on, and we integrated that into our platform. And um, we realized that it was still not enough. And you know, I've heard from, from my panelists, from my fellow panelists, the word leapfrogging. So we decided, okay, so how do we go about generating data at scale for the continent and supporting or taking innovation and helping the continent leapfrog? So we pivoted towards also building a constellation of nanosatellites. So now you have the processing platform. We're building the constellation of nanosatellites. Our first one is going up next year. And then all of a sudden, we're able to open a wide range of opportunities and innovation. But that's not enough, because if I do that, I provide data to businesses, to governments, but what about our people? How do we actually close the loop and use that data, that same data that we're selling into businesses, to build more resilience and profitability for small-scale businesses and farmers at the last mile? And for us, this was the opportunity and the innovation we wanted to drive. We're really a company who is trying to drive growth on power's impact, because ultimately, if we don't enable our people, we will go nowhere. 
Kate, um, can you actually give us an example of how the user, so ultimately a smallholder farmer, will be able to benefit from Amini? Absolutely. So there are two cases. We can talk about insurance um, that everybody knows, and we can talk about also food and beverage or cosmetic companies who are buying from small older farmers on the continent. We had a, um, a thesis that every economic development starts with the availability of data. So if you see the world that we have today um, in the US and Europe, the fact that we're able to hold iPhones today, it all started with an explosion of data. Um, and then machine learning, AI made a lot of advancements using this data. But for us, for technology to be truly useful, it has to be invisible. So when we started the company, we never wanted to introduce any new technology to farmers. We said, okay, we will give access to that to businesses, but how do we make it transparent for the farmers, but also useful? Um, and we decided to build a system that allows a company such as Mondelez, for example, who is sourcing cocoa from West Africa, Ghana, and, and Cote d'Ivoire. We're tracking data at the farm level. We're able to understand soil, crop health. We're able to measure um, deforestation, providing that data to Mondelez, but also allow Mondelez to, sell, to send insights to the farmers. And what we realized through a couple of pilots is that just with those insights, farmers are able to improve their productivity by 80 to 90%. And it's the incredible. way they are being delivered is via SMS and USSD that they are already using today. Fantastic. So data is the new invisible gold. Is that right? It is. <laughs> There's a, a lot of the ag tech companies, I think, here in the room would probably want to talk to you after. Um, but Nela, let's turn to you because I think you share similar philosophies. So can you tell us about Tola and um, the opportunity you saw and the potential for scale? Okay, um, one thing I would say that I've always been passionate about preventative health care. And if there's one thing about climate change uh, on Africa, it's going to take a different turn. Because anywhere in the world, we might just talk about climate change and what it does for the atmosphere. But on the African continent, it has an impact on health care because uh, it affects how we grow our food, the quality of our food, and downstream, uh, it has an impact on food security. Um, so what we started to do at Tola was to work on how do we increase biosecurity in our food production in terms of working with farmers to make sure that they start uh, creating more resilient methods uh, of producing food. Because a typical example is that um, with climate change, there's excessive heat. Um, some, some of our crops might grow quite quickly and get to harvest quite quickly. And some of the nutritional benefits like protein, zinc, and iron that we need in our crops may not be present. And downstream, you'd find that that's the biggest cause of uh, your cardiovascular diseases you find on the continent, and also some of the diseases you find in food that affect a lot of uh, mothers who are pregnant mothers and also children under the age of five years. So we started working on creating biosecurity compliance at large scale because with biosecurity compliance is we allow a lot of the farmers, we bring all those where we get to audit farms um, and make sure that they produce food at the level that is required um, globally to meet the standards of food that is needed in the retail markets. Because when, when we looked at right now, all those standards are tailored for large businesses your ISO certification, your global gap certification. So we took those standards and said, can we build them and lower them to smallholder farmers and food businesses? So we started saying, let's increase scale. Um, so right now we have built a model where farmers in the remote areas currently in South and Africa uh, that require compliance, they can reach out to us and match them with the nearest auditor uh, to run compliance at the farm. And part of compliance is that we, we, we equally train the farmers on what are the standards of production. So we work with them and when they meet those standards, we then audit them and when they are compliant, we match them to opportunities for trade because compliance allows them to do global trade or cross-border trade. So that's what we do. Fantastic. So in the hope, obviously, to increase the production of organic uh, uh, farming as well as uh, export, and so increasing the incomes of the farmers ultimately, thanks to a more infrastructure mesoplay. I think that's super interesting. 
um, and, and very needed, actually. So um, to all of you, we've talked about the opportunity a lot, um, but I want to turn to what, what's next? What will it take next, right? And especially coming out of the Africa Climate Summit, can we just hear in turn, what is in your view one, the major barrier standing in the way for progress and action to happen quickly? Because I think what also we heard from Bogolo is the need for speed, the need for scale, the need for increase of breadth of solution and financing instruments. So how do we get there? What is the one, number one barrier in, in your mind? James. So I, I think th this is not the number one barrier, it is a barrier I'm particularly focused on. Um, I think we have now a growing ecosystem where we can focus on the immediate needs in, in our local environments and, and generate the capital that's commensurate to tapping that. There's a different set of opportunities that require much larger amounts of capital to kind of build global competitiveness in a number of sectors where in kind of the carbon economy of the future. And one of the things I think is the next step here is making clear that, the, that investing in climate tech in Africa is really an advantageous thing for global capital to look at, that this is actually a place where you're getting more carbon per dollar spent or dollar invested than almost anywhere else. Because without that, some of the, you know, getting our university graduates and so on to go into deep tech, highly engineered approaches, or marshalling large numbers of people, because what we're talking about is putting thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to work, doesn't make sense unless you're raising capital at a scale that looks a lot more like climate tech companies elsewhere in the world, which it should, because at the end of the day, climate tech is one of those spaces where, you know, the carbon, the CO2 is everywhere in the world, we should just be going to where it makes most sense to do it. So one challenge for us is how do we tell the story of this is not, you know, this is not a sector that should be limited by investors' view of just the size of the African market, but rather the size of the addressable problem and Africa's ability to address that problem. Couldn't agree more, and it's um, sad that there's still quite some convincing to do uh, at a global level. Kate? I would say um, deploying at scale. We can't just build solution for one country or one specific region. We have to address the entire continent at once. Um, and probably one of the, the, the ways to do this is to work in a systemic way. Um, as a startup, we need to be able to have access to business, to capital, um, but also to government because government can be great distribution channels, but also to the MDBs because then you get to the regional level and you're able to get that to that, to that continental wide scale, right? Um, but how do we do that? Because we're entrepreneurs. How do I go about reaching out to the African Development Bank? How do I go about navigating them? Because again, it's a um, big institution, takes a lot of time to deploy. We're hearing, we heard a lot this week about a billion dollar facility here, a billion dollar facility there, and we've been working with them, but they're extremely slow. And as a startup, we, time is one of the most precious things that we have. Um, so how do we go about having that impact at scale, but also being able to navigate that ecosystem and have all of them work together? Right, right. How that big commitments go down to the small level and vice versa, That's right? small to big on a global scale when we talk about innovations. Absolutely. And Marie? Thank you. And if I may, I'm going to talk about three, three points. Um, so first <laughs> of all... <laughs> We need to go fast. What does that mean for capital? Um, that capital needs to take the risk and they need to have a leap of faith. We just don't have the luxury, luxury of time to have all the data that we need, um, all of the uh, analysis, all of the proofs or concepts. We really just have to have a leap of, of faith. Um, so, so my call really, and then this is our role as a catalytic investor, is to actually move fast, take the risk, show the results, and then pull in a lot more capital. So, so really calling on the, the capital allocators just to think a little bit about, you know, outside the box. Um, so secondly, is again to that point of scale. Um, the challenge that we have on this continent is that we're very fragmented. We're a big continent, but we have actually small markets. If we, if we were one united 
uh, state of Africa, it would be a different story. And so what does that mean? If we're going to get that scale in the fragmented economy, we need to have models where there is cross-learning, where there's aggregation, um, but importantly, that we're, we're communicating and we're engaging with our policymakers, because they're the ones that set the rule that, that actually inhibit capital to flow easily uh, across borders. So we need to get, we need to address the issue of fragmentation, and so we need to be collaborating or working with and communicating um, with, with our policymakers. Um, and then thirdly is, is the link between large pools of capital and the small pools of capital that are needed to drive the innovation that's going to be so important for us to, to actually take, uh, take advantage of the opportunities that exist. Um, if you're looking at renewable energy sources, you know, think about the mini grips, the solar systems, the pay-as-you-go solar systems. Um, we really need to be linking large pools of capital with these small pools of capital, uh, again, because we have to address the real barriers in our economies that are caused by the, the fragmentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so really, really just thinking outside the box, right. calling upon capital to think outside the box. Time yeah. is not on our side. Yeah, and if we absolutely. stick to our need, I, we need a 10, 20 percent, and we need, you know, we can't mm -hmm. take the risk because we don't know what's doing, it's just not going to work. A hundred percent. We've just got to get 100%. capital to think outside the box. Act quickly, maybe fail fast, but learn fast, and then we move on and, and keep going. Absolutely. Nele? I wish I could say more capital, uh, <laughs> because to start up capital is like air, um, but I'll distance myself from capital. Um, I think that um, more stronger relationships with uh, government and policymakers, uh, I will talk a lot more in our case. If there's one thing I've realized with compliance is that uh, it lies on the government's shoulders, the implementation and rollout on compliance. And I think it shouldn't be the case. Government should set policies, but they need to work with private sectors for the rollout of policies, of, of compliance. Because I look at it in Kenya, for example. I mean, I was talking to some startup that is telling me we have to wait over a month for us to be compliant because it's government that runs it. In a perfect world in developed countries, it's not government that runs it. Government sets the policies and private sectors are there to roll it out at mass scale. So I believe if we have those relationships with government, and being the ones that help government, because in the long run, it allows government to say, this is what we have done, the impact that we have done if we work with private sectors. Right. And I truly believe if we have that relationship, capital will be the, re the resultant of us achieving those relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, better private-public partnerships are, are really necessary if we want to make this work. And actually, I will um, take Bogolo up on her offer to use her platform uh, as a way for us to have strong messages coming out of the Africa Climate Summit and heading to COP28, where I think the voice of African innovators and African nations is going to be very strong. So in turn, what is one ask you have of her as we head to COP28? Or the champions in general? How do we, what would you recommend that they do? And I know this is a surprise question, but. <laughs> no, I, I, I just think that this, you know, we need to have a loud voice. Um, and, and this is a vibrant community. And if there is a way to represent that vibrancy at a very um, sort of uh, concentrated way, you know, just showing the millions of, of faces of, of, you know, founders driving a lot of these innovations, solving a lot of these problems. I think that just has to be very loud and clear because otherwise the conversation is dominated by MDB reform, need to mobilize capital, but, but to where, just as you said, just where is it supposed to go to? It's supposed to go here. It's supposed to go into these, these um, uh, you know, entrepreneurs. We need the funnels. We need the conduit. So we need you guys. Uh, mailers to provide the conduits and so that message has to be loud and clear and, and secondly what has to be loud and clear is that this is a land of opportunity there is so much going on and I think that's what I take away from being at the climate summit it's just the vibrancy of people running around going into the different you know panels and tents you know just just walking through there I didn't have to even attend any of the sessions that vibrancy was was very important to me that message has to be loud and clear in Dubai Vibrancy and loud. Take notes. James? So something that struck me even today and really throughout this week and 
frankly, this year has been just how diverse the things that we are working on on the continent are. And I think there's one aspect of this that is kind of raising Africa's voice and kind of saying, let's make sure that Africa's dynamic entrepreneurs and innovators, social and commercial, are being seen. I think there's a flip side to that, which is in every conversation, let's make sure that there are Africans present. And one of the things that struck me is that there were lots of Africans in conversations about smallholder ag agriculture uh, at the two COPs. I'm a, I'm a huge COP veteran. I've only been to two, <laughs> right? Um, but we are in the smallholder agriculture, the certification. There's a set of things. You can probably write the list, any of you, of the ones where you will see Africa well represented you will not see African voices necessarily, at least until recently, in the conversation about green hydrogen. And even if they're in that one, they won't be in the next one about hydrogen applied to technology X or Y. And what that does is it makes those conversations about every aspect of the big investments that are coming forward for the, you know, to address the climate crisis, they are completely blind to the continent. There's no one there saying, oh, you're looking for the following features? We have those. Right? And so there's something about us together telling the continent's story, and there's also going in and making sure that the continent is in as part of every aspect of the global response, because there's opportunity in every single one of those rooms for the continent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Kate? For me, it's always uh, interesting to see the energy from COP to COP. You go to COP, we talk a lot, there's a lot of commitments made, and then everybody disappears for a couple of months until the climate week happens, and then we all see each other again, and we talk again, and then we <laughs> more commitments made, and then we get to COP, and the dance starts again, right? So if I had one ask to make today is, let's make that next COP about action, um, and really focusing on deployment, what we can do in practice, and less in theory. Less big commitments, we need them, of course, but actually what does it mean in practice? Can we gather an ecosystem of people, leaders, who are already driving this innovation and are willing to work together to focus on the actions? Mm -hmm. That's what I really hope that comes out actually of this room today, that we don't just all hear, you know, have a great time and then walk away and never talk again. So do definitely follow uh, Kate's advice and continue to talk, continue to build towards the next COP and the one after, and, you know, but con that momentum has to be sustained. Nelly? Well, with me, I'm a startup funder and I need to make sure that I provide you your returns, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to anne <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and to you. So, 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 so my ask right now is quite, is quite clear. Um, I've said it very, uh, I've said it, um, that we need to make partnerships with government and with policyholders that will unlock us to being able to do biocompliance at large scale on the African continent because, because we need to set standards on the quality of food across the continent so that there is ease of cross-border uh, export of our goods mm -hmm. around the continent and outside the continent. I mean, right now you see there are a lot of shipping containers that go food when they come to the African continent and they leave the continent empty. Or sometimes even when they leave the continent full, they are stuck at the port because a lot of the goods are not compliant. So if we work with government and any other organization that has a key to unlock us, being able to scale compliance and scale mm -hmm. on the continent, that's what we want because I, our yeah. business needs to grow and I need to give you your returns. <laughs> Thank you, Nella. I love that you're so focused on that. Thank you. Everyone else in our portfolio, take note. <laughs> so uh, it goes back to the point I made in my opening remarks, like right, together. So what is, um, to close it up, because we need to go to Q&A and we're already behind, one word that you want to leave the audience with as we continue the festival and enter all the other fantastic sessions. Just one word. Anyone wants to go first? I'm not sure I can say it in one word, so I just say keep challenging the norm. Great. Um, for any Swahili speaker here, I would say Amini. It means believe, faith. So we have to have faith that um, we will be we will be successful at um, at this uh, transition, at this climate transition. Mm -hmm. James. Play to win and win big. Okay, Nelly. 
Well, I'm a Nike fan, so I'll just say, just do it. <laughs> Excellent ending. Excellent ending. Let's just do it. And let's give a round of applause to the great panelists here today. He's panicking and he's working. Okay, so we want to do a Q&A round really quickly. We are, we are running out of time, but I'm, I'm going to try and squeeze in just 10, 10, uh, five, 10 questions real quickly. Hi, thanks. My name's uh, Paul and I'm from uh, the company, startup company, Wild Bio. And maybe to James, we know agriculture is having a massive impact on the climate. And yet in Africa, probably it's one of the last continents that's got a huge amount of arable land and you've got commercial enterprises looking to uh, use that uh, to produce more food and of course the government wants more food because we, you need to get the price down. How do you see this, uh, uh, the other side of this picture where Africa needs to do climate transition and I think you gave a great example with uh, Vietnam. Uh, yes, you can go this normal route but how can we in Africa bring in action to, to almost counter, but you don't want to counter, you want government as partners, you want industry as partners. How can you really uh, address that where you don't have this massive conflict? The companies want to make money, they're big, the government wants to get cheap food uh, to its people. How do we address that? Um, I think the critical thing, Paul, it's a fantastic question, is you need to think about is there, you know, we designed most of our large industrial processes, and I count commercial agriculture in its 20th century form as an industrial process. We designed all of those in a world where carbon and emissions were valued at zero. And so they're all designed to just not care about emissions. It's not necessarily that you cannot meet the same levels of output without emissions, it's just that we never built systems like that. Now, most big commercial agriculture hubs in the world are already locked in to those systems, right? Very fertilizer intensive, emissions of nitrous oxide and so on and so forth, Not, let alone the emissions from making fertilizer and so on and so forth. But there's a lot of science that's saying, look, zero till agriculture, regenerative agriculture, uh, organic fertilizer, all of these things which actually in Africa today are probably cheaper than what's being used elsewhere if we particularly we focus on delivering them at scale and with quality, might actually be able to meet and maybe even exceed the yields of other types of commercial agriculture if we're serious about it. And even if they don't, once you introduce the carbon value, you might be able to then actually, in addition to the revenue from your, your yields, you're actually getting that cross subsidy from something in the, in the carbon markets or some other mechanism like that, or, or preferred access as low emissions agriculture. So I think the, the, the exact point that we are expanding our commercial agriculture, let's not make the mistake of copying systems that are simply non-viable. Let's be the ones saying we are an early adopter of what seems to work at scale. That's good. Yeah. Ah, we have a question over here. Is there another one? I see another one. Is there another question? So I just know where to be. Just two more. Okay. Hi. Uh, this is Neil from uh, Climate Kick. I just wanted to ask what your view might be on uh, the role of larger companies help and um, working with uh, development agencies and philanthropies to develop demand-led innovation challenges for startups to perhaps provide a market opportunity for them to. Uh, uh, develop their solutions and bring them to the big companies and test them out in practice at a meaningful scale, helping to open up the market for them and perhaps attract investments. Do you see those sorts of demand-led innovation challenges playing any role in this, or do you think maybe they might be too small to make a significant difference? Good to hear your thoughts. All right, that, yeah, that was good. Anyone wants to take that? Um, no, yeah, I mean, I think that that really is also part of the, the ecosystem. And I was having a conversation yesterday with somebody who was talking about the need for any company to think about their value chain. And sometimes you actually have to invest in your value chain. So if you're a large corporate, um, you have to think about your value chain and, and, and really taking a position on what do I need to invest into or support because that's important for me. I think a lot of the banks are doing that. I've seen, seen banks, for example, in South Africa who set up these sort of um, uh, hubs or tech hubs because what they're trying to do is create the ecosystem of 
um, uh, services um, to the corporates that they're financing. So yes, it is a very important part of the ecosystem, and, and I think there are players that are doing that. Good morning. Thanks so much for the panel discussion. My name is Wendy Chamberlain, and I'm with Bussara Center for Behavioral Economics. So guess what I'm going to ask you about? What behaviors need to change? What shifts do we need to see in mindsets about how to approach this topic? James has kind of alluded it to, uh, to it a bit in terms of seeing this as an opportunity. But if we break this down, what would be the most desirable behaviors you see shift? Thanks. Great question. Someone wants to go first? I'll start from the, again, from yeah. capital, from, the, from okay. the point of view of capital. I mean, I do think that there is an important behavioral change that needs to happen in the minds of the capital owners and capital allocators. Because at the end of the day, what does a return on investment mean if we don't have a planet that we live in? And so, so there has to be a change of behavior in how you consider um, your, your return on investment, and it, it should be more than just a financial return on investment. And we're doing quite a lot of work around that. So how do you value a return from a nature perspective? You know, that needs to be calculated into your return on investment. Um, and so the more we can get um, capital allocators to think that way, to change that behavior, the more capital is going to flow to where it's needed um, in order to ensure that we are actually building on opportunities that protect nature, that reduce CO2 emissions, and that create a sustainable living planet for all of us. So that's, the, for me, one of the big major behavioral changes we need to see. I, I think very much along those lines, uh, the, other, the other lens I would bring is, if we think about what has counted as cool, uh, exciting entrepreneurship over the last 20 years, it's been riding the digital revolution. It's been three, four young people in a room somewhere in a garage at laptops, uh, relatively modest amounts of capital uh, and massive returns. And you know, you kind of, you know, the prototype begins quick. We're dealing in the world of bits. Um, and there's still a lot of bits level innovation to be had in climate. But climate is primarily a world and a game of atoms and molecules. And it's a world where the coolest startups in Africa are not going to be in a, you know, in a trendy, kind of a loft somewhere in a, sit, in a, in a, in a city neighborhood, they're, they're going to be you know, muddy feet in the farm tracking what's happening. They're going to be in, a, in an industrial site with overalls kind of figuring out that. And that shift, you know, firstly, you can see it. Actually, there's a signal, right? Who are, you know, think about who are the richest people in the world the last three decades. And think about who's the richest person in the world today there's a transition in where huge value is to be had. And it's in actually working with material things. You go to a place like Octavia and you hang out with Duncan and his team, and you see that actually, we have a lot of that talent in Africa. People know how to do things with their hands. People know how to make things from things. And we need to bring that to the pinnacle of what it means to be an entrepreneur and an innovator because it was kind of forgotten in the world of you know, app of the day or app of the week. There's nothing wrong with apps. I think we may have hit diminishing returns though. Jack, I'm gonna do, pay, att pay attention to me bro. Come on, me and you, me and you, let's do it. I'm gonna do one last question and then we have to run. Thank you very much. My name is Marianne Moniki. Um, I'm now an entrepreneur after recovering as a banker. Um, the question I have is the nexus between green and blue jobs and this whole conversation around climate. Often, you know, people will continue to cut the trees to make charcoal because they need the firewood, right? Um, so what is it that we're going to do to ensure that jobs are in the core of this conversation and especially jobs for youth? Should I answer yes, that? Yes, that is a fantastic question. Actually, yesterday I was in another of the many events and somebody said, you know, in Africa you can't talk about climate change just in the context of environmental impact. It's really very much about livelihoods and livelihoods it's about jobs. So, Nele, do you have an answer yeah, to that? I think because jobs are at the core of what we do, because when we do 
by security compliance at scale, we train people at the lower level to become um, accredited auditors. They could be organic um, compliance auditors, food safety, water safety. So it's a way for us creating jobs. And when you get people at the lower level, at community level, uh, accelerating compliance, they are also getting to teach other farmers on what it means to be compliant. Because when we talk about the climate transition, we could talk about it at a policy level where we talk about how financiers have to handle it, but we also have to talk about it at a lower level where everyone is conscious about what we need to do uh, to be able to contribute to net zero. So uh, with us, we have uh, tackled it in such a way of saying, let's create jobs in the process, because once you give people a good livelihood, it accelerates the message of climate transition. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just think for us as an investor in financial solutions and intermediaries, um, with the way we are measuring success from an impact perspective is going to be how finance, or how is finance financing growth that creates those green, sustainable jobs, and that is just very key. We're not doing this just to finance something, but we're doing this to drive finance, to drive the economic growth that's going to lead to the jobs and the sustainable uh, outcomes for, for all of us. So, so really key to, to everything that we do from a sort of outcome perspective. Great, and I think we're actually unfortunately out of time, so big round of applause for these panelists. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope this really helped frame the conversation for the rest of the day and set the stage. Uh, so thank you all. And we're going to go on to our next panel. Nice. And to my Elise for hosting. Let's give her thanks. Very well done. You can leave your mics on the chair.